Because essentially what it comes down to, this is the crux, I suppose, for me, is that your work is around some sort of biological basis, genetic biological basis. But the zeitgeist for the time at the, at the moment would be one which probably had more influence in the 1950s from anthropology, from people like Franz Boas and, and Margaret Mead, which is social constructionism. So people talk about, well, gender's just a construct. So it's just that we make it up. So if the reason I'm male is because people taught me to be male. And this is an idea that's taken on. And I can understand why it's taken on because it kind of explains to people why you would be, you know... Uh, born you know with male phenotype but then feel as though your whole life you've been a woman but the interesting thing was that it was exactly that ideology that really affected the dsd population because what these people did was they came in and said well look you know gender is only a social construct so it doesn't matter if they've got ambiguous genitalia just pick the one that looks the most likely and, and surgically remove the rest and raise the person as a girl or a boy or whatever else and they'll be fine of course they weren't because there was something biological yeah. about their identity. Well, of course, there's a huge cultural uh, emphasis on gender, and yes. there's huge arguments about how much is socially constructed. I'm a mother. I'm now a grandmother. I have grandson, granddaughters, and nobody can tell me that there's no biological differences. They yeah. are so different. And I think most parents would recognise that even if they try to bring up their little girls to play with trucks, they will play with dolls. And their little boys will play with guns, even if you give them dolls for Christmas. There are things that every parent notices, and they're much deeper than cultural constructs. Given that, though, of course, there are huge cultural pressures to yes. conform to one sex or the other. I mean, my hope is that one day it'll actually cease to matter if men and women were really equal in the eyes of the law and society, then what does it matter what you are? We are not in that happy place yet, though it does matter. There are all kinds of pressures to make little girls into princesses and little boys into heroes. And I would love to see those cultural pressures cease, but I can't see that happening anytime soon. It's not as though these ideas like gender are not to some extent culturally constructed. I think it's interesting to admit that, of course, there's huge social pressures to conform one way or the other, but probably people are genetically more or less susceptible to them. Right. So little boys who have more of the feminizing genes are much more likely to rebel against being given a gun for yes. Christmas and going to shoot ducks or something. And I think there's probably that's the way that these other genes are expressed is to make children much less susceptible to, to social pressures to be a certain sex. If they have very strong feminizing genes, they're not going to put up with that. If yes. a girl has very strong masculinizing genes, she's not going to be put up with being told that she's a princess and has to wear wings. <laughs> I guess you've also talked about, um, was it the work of Dean Hammer? Dean Hamer, yes. Hamer, sorry. He was a, um, a, who's somebody I, I met many years ago. So he published in, I think it was 1998, uh, the first really good study uh, looking specifically for gay genes. Yes. There'd been speculation, you know, how much of this was genetic and how much was uh, um, environmental for years and years. And, of course, it all gets very religious and all caught up in all kinds of stuff so, so, so he, he I watched the video and he talked about the right so right wing conservative politics probably oh, in America really yeah. affecting the idea that they really didn't want a biological basis well I didn't ever really understand that until somebody in America told me look you don't understand if there are gay genes that means God made a sinner and God can't make a sinner so yes. therefore there can't be genes what? That was the logic behind it. Uh, and so yes. very strong it was. So Dean Hamer came out with a study that I looked through with great interest and with, uh, I thought it was an excellent study. Mm. Uh, I mean, the problem with homosexuality, at least in 1998, was that there are lots of gay people who don't want to come out. And so doing twin studies and that sort of thing, you're always going to underestimate the frequency of homosexuality and the because concordance in twins. 
wins so because people don't want it's to like admit It's like a self-report, essentially. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. So, uh, obviously, a lot of people were not out of the closet and didn't want to come out. So, that yeah. was a problem. So, he looked specifically at brothers who were both out and gay. And right. so he did not have that problem. And he looked specifically uh, for families in which gay brothers had gay male relatives on the mother's side. Right. Now, that may seem strange to you, but that's looking specifically for genes on the X chromosome the, that are inherited oh, yes. by males only from their mothers. Yes. So I thought that was a very smart thing to do because he was boiling it down to a, a smaller number of people but looking very specifically for... Uh, uh, for something on the X chromosome. And what he did was compare all the genes up and down the X chromosome and look for what parts of the X both brothers had inherited. And that pointed to a particular region on um, the bottom of the X chromosome, which has now been substantiated three separate times. uh, And said, yes, well, there's at least one gay gene here. Right, uh, and, and we still don't know what it is. Right, but there certainly is one there, and there's probably several others that people have uh, used the same kinds of methods to identify. Yeah. I'm saying there's probably hundreds. You've talked about. I think you wrote about the Human Genome Project identifying at least three or four more chromosome eight. Um, well, there are similar studies to Dean Hamer's, and yeah. th- there was a lot of controversy about that, but I think there's no question that there are lots, there are at least three or four well-substantiated gay genes there. My, What I've said is I don't believe they're gay genes. Right. What I think they are is male-loving yes, genes. Yes, I do want to, did want to ask you about that. Um, yeah. Or female-loving could be potentially... Well, a- I mean, the mystery to me is not that there are male loving genes because selection will uh, make choice is one of the hottest selectable traits there are yes. in fruit flies humans and everything else so it's absolutely not surprising if they're male loving genes but they'll be selected for in females right. so females that have male loving genes are likely to partner early and have more kids this is an italian study isn't it and in fact they do there's yes. italian studies that said they have a lot more kids a lot more kids 1.3 more children that's than, right uh, than uh, i mean it's astonishing females. and i um, the reason i wrote that article in the conversation was that this was really not known in the gay community right. and I thought well that's terribly important to know these are not gay genes they're male loving genes and they're very common because they're selected for in the female relatives of gay men Yes. so if gay men don't have as many children it doesn't matter because their sisters and, and aunts do have more children so the right. gay genes keep on being pretty, uh, pretty high frequency in the pop 